ಆಂಗುಷ್ಟಮಾತ್ರಪುರುಷೋ ಮಧ್ಯ ಆತ್ಮನಿ ತಿಷ್ಟತಿ ಈಶಾನೂತಭವ್ಯಸ್ಥೋವಿಜುಗುಪ್ಸತೆ ಏತದ್ವಾಯ್ಥತ್ the being arusha of the size of a thumb resides in the body knowing him as the ruler of the past and the future one does not want by virtue of that knowledge to save the self this is that shankaracharya's tika angushta matraha of the size of a thumb The lotus of the heart is of the size of a thumb and as conditioned by the internal organ existing in the space within the lotus of the heart the self has the size of a thumb just like the space in a section of a bamboo that is of the size of a thumb purushaha e by whom everything is filled knowing him who tishtati stays madhye atmani in the body as the ishanam bhuta bhavyasya the ruler of the past and the future ataha knowing this na vijugupsate does not save himself because he is fearless e tat vai tat this is that brahman ಅಂಗುಷ್ಟಮಾತ್ರಪುರುಷೋ ಜ್ಯೋತಿರ್ವಾಧುಮಕ ಈಶಾನೋ ಭೂತಭಾವ್ಯ ಸ ಊಷ್ವಾ ಪುರುಷ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸೈಜ್ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಥಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಅ ಲೈಟ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಸ್ಮೋಕ್ ಹಿ ಇಸ್ ದ ರೂಲರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಪ್ಯಾಸ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಫ್ಯೂಚರ್ ಹಿ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಟುಡೇ and he will exist tomorrow this is that and the tika moreover the angushta matra purushaha the purusha the all pervasive entity the size of a thumb is jyoti eva adhumakaha like a smokeless light he who is perceived as such by the yogis in their hearts is the ishana bhuta bhavyasya lord of the past and the future saha he the eternal unchanging exists adya now in all beings u and saha he will exist shvaha even tomorrow the idea is none equals him now nor will anyone in the future do so thus the upanishad dismisses the theory of momentary existence mentioned in verse 120 namaste so these two verses give a basis for a practice of meditation on the heart and of course we went over this in the previous video but it's worthwhile going through it again because this is really i mean the most beneficial practice really that i've ever tried and i started it a long time ago when i read the same thing in bhagavad gita in fact in bhagavad gita there are several verses that indicate the lord in the heart in the form or in the size of a thumb and there in many other puranas and other scriptures the same truth is given and this goes back to the first chapter verse 20 shankaracharya mentions in his tika where the theory of non-existence after death was mentioned i'll read it to you this doubt that arises consequent on the death of a man some saying it exists and others saying it does not exist i would know this under your instruction So in other words there are some people especially the Buddhist philosophers who say there is no self after death. Buddha himself however didn't ever say this. When people tried to press him on 
Uh, are you going to exist after death or are you not going to exist? He passed on the question. He set it aside. He said, this is not a valid question because existence or non-existence are two extremes, a duality. The Tathagata, meaning himself, the Buddha, teaches the path in the middle. From ignorance, fabrications arise. From fabrications, consciousness arises. From consciousness, name and form arises, and so on. So he was not a fan of these extreme uh, polemics of either it exists or doesn't exist. He was saying the self, the mundane self, the individual self, self with a small s, <laughs> arises as part of the process of becoming. So if you understand the process of becoming, you'll understand this whole thing is a fabrication, and it never existed in the first place. So how could it, how can you even ask the question whether it exists or not after death? Missing the point. So anyway, for those who are <laughs> still convinced that they are this transient individual self, which always goes through so many changes in the course of a lifetime, what to speak of from one life to the next, that this method is given in many scriptures and is explained deeply in the Upanishads. I was doing research in the Chandogya Upanishad, which might be the subject of our next series. is either that or the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Anyway, in Shankara's introduction, he says, Though this treatise deals mainly with the science of non-duality, yet herein are described several forms of meditation and worship which are conducive to several desirable ends. Because these forms of meditation and worship bring about results nearly as good as liberation and appertain to slightly modified forms of the one pure Brahman, which have been spoken of as consisting of the mind, having the life breath for its body, and so forth. All this meditation and worship brings about the fulfillment of actions and is related to the auxiliaries of those actions. There is a similarity also between the meditations and the cognition of the one, in that both are esoteric in their character and both fall within the purview of the mind, just as the cognition of one without a second is a function of the mind. So also are the other forms of meditation and worship mere functions of the mind. So really, there is no separate self. There is no individual existence. All these are simply fabrications. And there is no separate Lord either. This is also a fabrication. But in the conditioned state of consciousness, it's very difficult for people to concentrate their mind on the idea of the one non-dual Brahman because they are used to dealing with differences in everyday life. And even our language is based or contingent upon the existence of duality and differences and contrasts and cause and effect and so many other uh, symptoms of duality. So in the beginning, a meditation on the Lord in the heart of the size of a thumb is given as a metaphor in other words, it's not really that way, but that's a place where you can start. And this area within the area of the heart, which is the size of a thumb, is like a gateway. And this gateway goes into a higher dimensional space where the real truth will be revealed. <laughs> Once one is purified by hearing from the teacher and the scriptures, that's what Upanishad means. Upanishad means come here, come close, and sit down and listen to this esoteric truth. It's esoteric because only a few people understand what it means. 
So this truth has to be understood for the meditation to reach fruition, for it to actually result in self-realization. But anyway, you can start. And because the meditation is actually bona fide, it's actually authorized, it's authentic, it will give results whether you have knowledge or not. <laughs> I'm laughing because in my life, the experiences I've had in meditation or as a result of meditation have always been like way beyond my understanding and knowledge at the time. And I had to work very hard for a long time <laughs> to actually understand what had happened to me. So, uh, you know, this means the meditation gives results whether you understand what's going on or not. But he goes on to say later on in his introduction uh, that this knowledge speeds up and enhances the fruits of the meditation. Well, of course, if you know what you're doing, it's going to give a better result. That's true of any process, of any kind of work, any action. So this is a result of action, which in non-duality, action is generally condemned. In fact, death says in one of these mantras that death means ignorance, desire, and action. Because we are ignorant, we have a desire for the transient things of this world. Silly us, huh? And so we go running after them. <laughs> and this action produces the result that we have to suffer due to the results of our karma. So, I mean, you, you know, people will do almost anything, or maybe literally anything, to get what they want. Though the problem is not what they want, it's the fact that they want it. That is a desire, that it's an obsession, a compulsion. And they have to follow it no matter what, because really they don't know any other way to live. They don't know any other way to be. They have not sat down with someone, a teacher, a guru, who is without desire. They have not seen how he lives, felt the energy of his being, which is far more concentrated than an ordinary being because he is in connection with the self. Bhagavad Gita says, Yogo yukta prasanatma, nasho chati nakanchati. One who is united with the self in yoga, yoga means connecting, linking, having a relationship. Nasho chati nakanchati, he doesn't worry about anything, he doesn't want to have anything, he doesn't grieve. As the Upanishad says uh, in some of the earlier verses, that one who knows this self does not grieve because he knows I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not any of these things around me. Uh, what to speak of this false self, this false ego, uh, from the cradle we're told that your name is so and so. You are in this family, you're in this country, this is your home, and so on. And this is your body, this body is you. But one who knows the self realizes that's not true. And that actually everything that seems desirable, that seems to be something that we should be identified with or attached to, is actually false. And once we realize that, and it is all maya, <laughs> then this attachment drops off. This identification fades away. And this desire ceases. Because why should I desire something that's only going to give me suffering? Thus, one comes into union with the self. And there's no more sense of being an individual. Rather, one feels that I am everything, I am everywhere, I am all. And this is the pinnacle of self-realization. Aung Tat Sat, 
Aum Shakti Aum Aum Namah Shivaya.